All right, Alexander, let's do an update as to what's going on in Ukraine. But let's talk more about uh, what Putin said in uh, Astana during the CIS, former Soviet Republic, uh, forum that took place a couple of days ago. Um, Ukraine is uh, undergoing a kamikaze drone uh, problem. I guess that's the best way to put it. They have no answer for the drones, and it seems that these drones... And the missiles as well from Russia can pretty much hit any target they want at any time in any major city, even the city center of Kiev, which no one talks about it. But, you know, I've, I've been saying this for, for quite some time. I'm astonished that uh, they, they could hit the very center of Kiev, of the capital yeah. city like that. Yes. I mean, it, it's yes. shocking if, if yes. there would be one place that would be protected you know, top to bottom, left to right, it would be your capital city of, of Kiev. But it seems like that is completely vulnerable to Russian drones and missiles. Anyway, we have a lot of uh, of drones and missiles hitting a lot of important targets all over Ukraine, um, specifically the energy grid, the headquarters of, uh, of the energy car company, uh, U- Ukrenergor, I believe is the name, and uh, also vital railway links. We have the Herson offensive, which they keep on trying to break through in Kherson and Zaporozhye as well, the Ukraine military. They have a very, very small window, if they even have a window at this point in time, maybe a week, maybe two weeks. And then we have Putin's speech where he talked about Kiev and he talked about the uh, viability of a Ukrainian state, if that's even uh, possible at this point in time. And he said some very interesting things that not many people have discussed, but you did discuss it in one of your videos and you would like to expand on that. So where do you want to begin? Well, let's let's talk about the military situation and the overall situation in Ukraine, which I think, by the way, you summarized very well. I have little to add there. I mean, it's clear now that we have a missile and drone offensive against Ukraine, which is ongoing. I think it's going to continue for the next, at this level, for weeks and months. I also think this is planned, by the way. I mean, the Russians initially sold it as a response to the Crimea bridge attack. But I I have to say, the more I see of this and the longer this goes on for, the more my opinion hardens that this was always the plan at this point, you know, that they were going to launch these missile strikes and these attacks on the infrastructure, on the railway system, on the... uh, SBU headquarters, that's the intelligence agency's headquarters in Kiev, the um, headquarters, as you said, of Ukrainergo. And of course, you know, they're also demonstrating something else, which is that they can strike at the government headquarters. They can strike at Bankovo, which is the building where Zelensky has his office. They can strike anywhere. It seems they could strike the foreign ministry. They could strike the uh, defense ministry. They can do these things. And I think it's only a question of time before they do that. And you're quite right. Ukraine has no response to this. They've not, they're not able to shoot down the big missiles, you know, the cruise missiles, not at least in anything like the number that they need to to parry these attacks. But against these kamikaze drones, which come in huge numbers, they don't seem to have any response at all. There are now pictures. Ukraine doesn't particularly want us to see these pictures. So the government there is trying to restrict publication of pictures. I don't blame them for that, by the way, because they're very demoralizing. But you see Ukrainian soldiers, the only thing they can do, apparently, to try to stop these drones is to shoot at them with their rifles. It's it's really actually, I mean, it's, it's tragicomic to see it. And by the way, on the topic of these drones, I mean, we hear an awful lot about one particular type of drone, the Geranium-2, which supposedly is based on an Iranian design, might even be provided by Iran. But apparently there's an awful lot of other types of drones, including one called the Lancet. Which So these drone swarms are made up of lots of different drones, which attack in different ways. So some come vertically, some come, you know, horizontally, they come at you from all sorts of directions. And it's clear that Ukraine doesn't have a response to that. And what Ukraine has been trying to do, and there's rumors that they've been pressed to do this also by the US, 
policed by the administration, which is becoming increasingly concerned that, you know, support for Ukraine is flagging, especially in the US, is they've been trying to keep their offensives going. So over the weekend, a big attack in Kherson region, they sent, you know, an armored column trying to trundle across the, the open step. Um, trouble is the weather's become increasingly bad. The ground is soft. The tanks got bogged down, it seems, They're picked off by Russian artillery and helicopters and jets. They had to pull back. Lots of tanks destroyed, lots of armored vehicles destroyed, lots of losses. They've been trying to do the same in other places. So far, it looks like their offensive is getting bogged down. It, it, that it's Perhaps the time window has already closed, but it's certainly closing. More and more of these reservists are now coming into, in, are joining the Russian military, which is now, it's now thickening out. The Russian lines are solidifying. And of course, we're also getting information from Bakhmut City, this key fortified linchpin of Ukrainian defenses in Donbass, in Donetsk City. The Daily Telegraph sent some journalists there. We got a report about that yesterday. It looks like Donet uh, Bakhmut City is indeed about to fall. There's reports earlier, just a few hours ago, that there's now fighting in the centre of the city. I can't, conf We can't confirm that, but th those are the reports. And Zelensky himself is admitting that the situation in Bakhmut City is becoming very difficult, by which he means it's becoming very bad. And all the indications are that Bakhmut City is about to fall. So a bogged down Ukrainian offensive, a Russian offensive in Donbass, which has never ceased and which apparently is about to win a big prize, which is this big fortified linchpin city, Bakhmut. And of course, drone strikes and missile strikes across Ukraine at intensifying tempos, putting enormous pressure on the Ukrainian economy and on Ukrainian society. And there's been an article in the Washington Post of all places, which now says that the morale boost that the Ukrainian military, the Ukrainian army, the Ukrainian soldiers had, which came after the victory in Izium, that's all gone. And now the mood amongst the soldiers, Ukraine's own soldiers, is becoming increasingly restless and demoralized. They are becoming more and more unwilling. This is not from Washington Post. I've been reading in other places. They've been more becoming less willing to go on the attack. There's been more protests again about soldiers being sent into the meat grinder and um, things from a military side and from an economic side, from every conceivable side for Ukraine are not looking good. So that's my assessment of the actual situation on the ground. And of course, we've now had these very interesting comments from Putin, which everybody missed, including when they first came out myself because I was taking things from Western translations of his words, which is always unwise. Um, now I've seen the Kremlin's own official translation, and I've checked the accuracy of that translation against with Russian members of our Duran community. I should say that, and I should say that I'm thankful for that, to see whether that translation is accurate. It seems that it is. And I think these were momentous words and they haven't been picked up because what happened was that Putin was asked repeatedly by a Russian general, journalist called Kolesnikov, who works for a newspaper, a big Russian newspaper, important Russian newspaper called Kommersant, one, by the way, which is relatively lib liberal in its political orientation. He was asked... Do you expect that there will still be a Ukrainian state when this war is over? And Putin responded, when we launched this special operation, we had n no intention of occupying the whole of Ukraine. He used the past tense. He didn't use the present tense, leaving it open that the 
policy may now have changed. And I've now had various Russians, actual, you know, native speakers come to me and they've said that, you know, the impression that Putin's words gave to Russians was that, yes, when we started back in February, we did not intend to occupy all of Ukraine. But we've seen we see the situation is changing all the time. Ukraine refuses to negotiate. The Western powers refuse to negotiate. The situation has now changing. And it is entirely possible, but will not be our fault. But at the end of this, there might indeed be no Ukrainian state left. That was the impression that apparently the Russians got. Well, let me read it to you, Alexander as to what he said exactly so that, you know, you can then comment on it. So, Kamersant, this is the second question that they gave to him. This is the second time that they asked it. They said, will Ukraine be able to exist as a state? And will Russia? That was a question. And Putin said, look, we weren't, we were not going to, we had not, we hadn't tasked ourselves with the destruction of Ukraine. Ukraine cut off water to Crimea. We had to send our military in to reopen the water supply. Now they blew up the bridge and we have to be thinking carefully about the land corridor with Crimea, you see? Now in the video you did on your channel, you actually met, you, you left something out in your commentary just now. Um, very important, the use of the past tense. We weren't going to, and we had not tasked ourselves with the destruction of Ukraine, meaning, as you just said, when we first started, it wasn't our intention to destroy Ukraine. But then in your video that you did on your channel, and I'm going to remind you of this now, as I'm reading Putin's answer, Putin, and Putin says that he, he speaks in the past tense with regards to Ukraine and the intentions of Ukraine, but he doesn't answer the question from Kamersant in the present or future tense, he immediately changes the topic in a way. Exactly. And he talks about exactly. water being cut off from Pamea, uh, the water supply, the bridge, and stuff like this. And then he says, you see, in, in other words, giving his uh, kind of giving his intentions for uh, what awaits in, in the conflict. But um, he, he avoids answering the question directly. And I think yes. that's also important. So he uses the past tense. Yes. And he changes uh, the focus of the question right away. Absolutely. Now, the important thing to understand Putin about Putin is that when he answers questions, he always, nearly always answers them very straightforwardly. <laughs> this is not a man who engages in evasions. Um, that's one of the things which makes his comments in this particular case interesting. So when he was asked by Commerçant, you know, are we going to destroy Ukraine? He could have simply said, no, that's not the plan. That is not what we are intending to do. But he doesn't say that. He says that hadn't been our plan. He uses the past tense. So he evades an answer. He leaves the possibility open that Ukraine may indeed be destroyed at the end of this military operation. And I repeat again, Russians in Russia, members of our Duran community, people who follow the follow, you know, what Putin said, because I specifically asked for Russians to come forward. They have said that the impression they got from listening to these words is that the possibility that Ukraine may cease to exist as a state is now a real one, at least in Putin's mind. And that was what he was in effect with this very evasive use of language conveying to the Russian people. I cannot emphasize what a huge shift this is. I mean, it, it, it is an enormous shift. Um, previously, the Russians have consistently denied that they have any intention of dismantling Ukraine as a state. Now, Putin himself, the president, is leaving open that possibility. Yeah. Uh, just to finish off the video, um, there was another part during this uh, press conference, another question where they asked about um, Kiev 
and and basically what happened in uh, in Kiev and and Putin talked about the uh, <clears throat> opening months of the special military operation and how there was a chance for a ceasefire when they had Kiev, for lack of a better word, when they had it surrounded. I don't think it was actually surrounded, but when their military forces were around the area. And he talked about the goodwill gesture. Once again, this is the Russian narrative. The collective West narrative is the siege of Kiev and the retreat of the Russian forces. The Russian narrative is that they had an agreement on the table brokered by, uh, by Turkey. Um, according to Putin, Zelensky was about to, to initial those documents and sign off on that agreement. And uh, as a goodwill gesture, the Russians removed their troops from Kiev and from other uh, cities in central Ukraine. And Putin, it seemed to me that as he was discussing this, he was. He felt as if uh, one uh, an opportunity was lost because the collective West meddled and got Alensky to pull out of this deal. So he was kind of bitter in a way at the fact that upset at the fact that an opportunity had uh, had been lost to to stop the conflict before it even got started. To to be honest, but there was also a sense of. Uh, of foreboding in a way of, of, of Putin kind of saying, okay, so we understood back then that if we really want to want to end this thing, we have to apply pressure to the real main decision-making center. We understood it then. And the impression that I got was we understand it now again as well, that we've, we've tried for peace multiple times. We, we we got the territory that we got. We've we've annexed the territory that that we've annexed. We're liberating Lugansk and Donetsk, and the collective West. All they do is escalate and escalate. So now we understand that we have to re uh, re engage with the idea of of striking some sort of uh, of blow in Kiev, of looking kind of revisiting Kiev. Do you think that was an accurate take on that line of, of questioning from, from Putin and, and the media? That, that's the impression that I got as he was answering. That's exactly the same impression which I got. I, I mean, I, I, the, point, the point to understand is that, you know, we've, there's been lots of discussions by many people about why the Russians pulled back from Kiev and the areas around at the end of March. But the Russians have consistently said, I'm talking about the Russian government, the Russian leadership, the Kremlin, Putin, all those officials, they have consistently said that the reason they did it was because there was a peace agreement on the table. It looked as if peace was about to be secured and they pulled back as a goodwill gesture. And they've spoken many times about the fact that the U Ukraine then went back on what it had agreed under the urging of people like Boris Johnson and that that Russian goodwill gesture was, in effect, to no to no purpose. It was it it took away from Russia that essential leverage that they had over the Ukrainians, which is what forced them to go to negotiate. And without that leverage, it's clear that the Ukrainians will never agree to anything. So the way Putin was talking to me clearly signals. <laughs> more moves coming against Kiev. Now, going back to your earlier points, the, what we started this program with, we now have drone attacks, missile attacks in Kiev. Missile attacks, drone attacks against important buildings in Kiev, clear indications to the Ukrainians that there's no place in Kiev that is safe now. They can attack anything, they can attack everywhere, they can strike wherever they choose. The Russians can strike wherever they choose. We also have a Russian military buildup in Belarus. 140 kilometers from Kiev itself, the Russian strike on Kiev back in February, March, came from Belarus. Now, Russian troops are moving into Belarus in significant numbers. We also see very powerful Russian fighter jets, MiG-31 fighter jets, being deployed to Belarus as well. So a, you know, a, a strike force 
appears to be in the process of being created there. Now, of course, the official narrative, it's only 9,000 men, it's all defensive, maybe it is, maybe it's not. But anyway, fact is, Russian troops are now being deployed in this important area where they can strike at Kiev. And last but not least, we have these words of Putin's. We have this talk of Putin that, you know, when we withdrew from Kiev, we lost our leverage and the Ukrainians went back on what they promised. And you can put it all together. And it does seem to me that a strike on Kiev is coming. Now, I may be wrong. <laughs> it may be that, you know, I'm adding the, I'm, you know, I'm putting two and two together and making, and, you know, saying five rather than four. But, you know, you can look at these facts. You can, that's the only conclusion I can draw from this. It seems to me that a strike on Putin, uh, on Kiev is on its way. Probably around November, December. And, of course, the head of the Belarus Intelligence Service has said that it could all be over by February. And a prominent member of the Ukrainian military says that said apparently um, that if there was a strike on Kiev like that, Kiev could fall within two to three months. All right, we will leave it there. TheDuran.Locals.com. Go to the Duran shop, 10% off. Use the code good day and look for us on Rockfin as well. That will have a link to our Rockfin channel down below. Take care.